Welcome, everyone, and thank you for attending our joint uh, town hall uh, today. Assemblyman Berman and I are here today because of a conversation that began in the wake of the shooting spree in Half Moon Bay. I reached out and suggested we do something jointly, and he readily agreed. It's the first joint town hall we've done, but we both felt it was so important and very and more powerful if we could do this uh, together. That shooting spree tragically left seven farm workers dead and one severely injured in January. Gone was any sense that these types of tragedies only happen somewhere else. Though California is ranked first in the nation when it comes to gun safety, that means absolutely nothing to the families of the Half Moon Bay victims. It certainly wasn't safe for them. And when I heard the news, you know, I was personally crushed. We met with the families of the farm workers. We were at vigils in Half Moon Bay together, Assemblyman Berman and I. A member of my team went to uh, back to Oaxaca to for the funeral of one of the farm workers who, because he was undocumented, he could only return to see the house he'd been building back in Oaxaca. Uh, he could only return in a casket. And as extreme as this event was, I was also reminded that gun violence, even in our state, happens every day. The United States overall is a huge uh, uh, outlier. The gun homicide rate 23 times um, higher than countries similar to ours. Guns, and because guns can still be brought in from out of state, um, we're going to always face challenges until Congress confronts the gun lobby and steps up and says enough is enough. We've helped read, uh, lead some real action here in California that we can be proud of. I've co-sponsored bills closing the gun show loophole and working on red flag laws. But we clearly have more to do on gun safety in California. It's powerful guns are, are still too easy to get that lead to suicides, to domestic shootings and accidental deaths. There's a line from the Mishnah, it's the first text of the Jewish oral law that reads, you're not obligated to complete the work, but neither are you free to desist from it. The victims of Hapman Bay will not be abandoned. And we will not desist from our work to, present, uh, to prevent similar tragedies in the future. I look forward to discussing today with some of our experts what more can be done here in California and, um, and to talk about some of the things that we're working on this session that our caucus is working on, like concealed carry regime and improving that in response to US Supreme Court rulings, a firearm liability insurance, and many other issues. And now I'd like to welcome uh, my co-host today, Assemblymember Mark Berman, who's been a real leader on these issues, and um, I'd like for him to say some opening remarks, and then he'll introduce our first speaker. Thank you. Thank you so much, Josh. And you're absolutely right. There certainly is more work to do. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining Senator Becker and myself today for this very important and timely discussion. Uh, if I haven't had the chance to, to, to meet you before, I'm Mark Berman. I represent the 23rd Assembly District in the California State Assembly. My district spans from Pacifica up north to Saratoga down south, uh, in addition to the San Mateo coast side from, from Pacifica down through Pescadero, all the way down to the Santa Cruz County border. Uh, I've been a founding member of our gun violence working group uh, in the assembly since it was founded four years ago, and a key priority of mine this session is gun violence prevention and safety. Uh, earlier this year, I was standing on the steps of the Capitol uh, with my assembly colleagues, honoring the victims of the Monterey Park shooting that had occurred just two days before. Uh, and to be honest, in my mind, in the back of my mind, I was kind of getting a little angry with myself uh, because I could tell that I was starting to feel, I was starting to feel desensitized to mass shootings. It felt like they were happening so often. Not even 10 minutes after I returned to my office, I got word that there was another mass shooting, uh, this time in Half Moon Bay in, in my district and in, in our mutual district or our overlapping districts that both Senator Becker and I represent. Uh, California has some of the strongest gun safety laws in the country, and these smart policies are saving lives. Approximately 2,000 lives a year uh, are saved in California in comparison to the average state on a per capita basis. And that's a huge deal. 2,000 people, that's a huge deal. But we have to do more. This year, I introduced a bill, AB 1598, 
to focus on getting accurate information on the risks of gun ownership to prospective gun buyers. People think that they'll buy a gun to keep themselves safe. But the reality is that if you have a gun in your home, the odds increase dramatically that you or someone you love will be the victim of gun violence, uh, either interpersonal violence or self-harm, or possibly an accident. Uh, in fact, the idea for this bill came from a conversation that I moderated last year with doc Dr. Wintemute, uh, who's one of today's speakers. And I've been fortunate to work with Dr. Wintemute on numerous efforts during my time in the Assembly. I also introduced another bill this year, AB 1420, which strengthens California's enforcement of laws that govern the sale, transfer, and storage of firearms. Too many gun shops are violating these laws and evading Department of Justice oversight. And under existing law, the Department of Justice only has limited authority to inspect firearm dealers, which means that even if a DOJ compliance unit sees certain violations, they can't take action on it because it's beyond the scope of their authority. So this bill allows the DOJ to conduct inspections of firearm dealers at least every three years to ensure compliance with California's life-saving gun safety laws. And this bill actually was a result uh, of research that my legislative aide was doing for that first gun bill that I just mentioned. Uh, she was calling gun shops to learn about the process of buying a gun. Uh, and the gun shop employees were practically encouraging her uh, to skirt California's gun laws. I've supported every effort in the legislature to reduce gun violence in our communities, and, and I promise to continue to do so. Uh, and this conversation today is critical for all of us to hear from experts and leaders who are working to reduce gun violence in our communities every day. Uh, so uh, it, uh, many people in our district wrote in. Oh, I, let me quickly uh, read through the list of, of speakers that we'll have. We have Garen Winnemute, uh, who's the director of violence prevention research program at UC Davis. Sheikha Hamilton, the vice president of organizing at the Brady Center to prevent gun violence. Rudy Espinoza Murray, spokesperson for Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense in America, and Dr. Jennifer DiBrianza, Palo Alto Unified School District Board President and longtime gun sense advocate. Many people in our district wrote in with questions about reducing gun violence, uh, and we will get to as many of those as possible. But first, we want to hear from each of our panelists. Uh, and our first panelist is Dr. Garen Wintemute. Uh, Dr. Winnemute is a renowned expert on the public health crisis of gun violence and a pioneer in the field of injury epidemiology and prevention of firearm violence. Dr. Winnemute's longstanding commitment to understand the nature of firearm violence and its underlying causes has produced a uniquely informative body of research on firearm violence that directly improves the health and safety of Americans and has positioned California and UC Davis as the national leaders in efforts to break the cycle of gun violence. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I've worked uh, on gun violence prevention efforts with Dr. Winnemute, uh, and I have just uh, a tremendous amount of respect uh, and appreciation for his expertise, and I'm looking forward to continuing to working together with him this year. So welcome, Dr. Winnemute. Assemblyman Berman, um, thanks very much, uh, and to you and Senator Becker for having me and all of us here. Um, I represent the idea and the fact that there is a science to the understanding and prevention of firearm violence. It's not mythology. Firearm violence can be approached, understood, and prevented the same way we address other major public health and social problems. I also represent a group of now more than 30 people uh, that began collaboration as a much smaller group 30 years ago uh, but now takes shape as the nation's first publicly funded center for research on firearm violence and its prevention. One of our major programs um, is the outgrowth of legislation um, sponsored, authored by Assemblymember Berman that created what's known as the Bullet Points Project. Um, and finally, I represent the, the, the fact that there is grounds for optimism about the future on this problem. Um, and with that, I'm looking forward to the conversation. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Winnemute. And let me uh, kind of kick things off. Uh, so here's a question that I hear a lot. Even with all of our laws uh, here in California, we still have mass shootings. So, so the question is, does gun control even work? Um, I get that question a lot, too. And 
I, I think the answer is an unequivocal yes. There are a number of strategies that have been shown to be effective. They appear to work particularly well together. And I'm gonna give you one example quite briefly. In the late 80s and early 90s, California's death rates from firearm violence were substantially higher than they were in the other 49 states put together. And then beginning with the Cleveland school shooting in Stockton and other tragedies, California woke up to this issue, framed it as an epidemic, approached it as a public health problem, and undertook over the span of five or six years or so an array of very strong uh, prevention approaches, many of which have been adopted since by other states. And the upshot of that is that our firearm death rates plummeted, and by the turn of the 21st century, were much lower than they were in the other states when they had been higher. And since then, in the 20 years since, our rates have been decreasing until the pandemic sort of upset the apple cart everywhere, while in the other 49 states, they were going up. In 2020, our firearm death rate was 60% lower than the rate in the other 49 states put together. I, I think uh, Senator Becker might might jump in with the next question, but I just want to say I, I really appreciate those points. After this, I wasn't aware of a lot of that data. And, and then we had the shooting and uh, Senator Becker and I both experienced the same thing, which was immediately everybody wanted to interview us and everyone expected that we had all the answers. Uh, and so I, we both did a lot of research and, and I saw those. It's data. It's quantifiable that shows that what we're doing in California, we haven't reached utopia yet. Of, of, of no gun deaths and, and no gun violence, but we're doing so much better than than the average state and so much better than so many other states. Uh, so I appreciate that point. Senator Becker, the floor is yours. Sure, thank you, Ron. Thank you for that. Uh, those, those stats as well, um, those are really important and we need to get those out. Uh, Peter spent a question saying, our son, our daughter-in-law, two or five grandchildren have been in lockdowns due to shootings. Two are at their schools, one at a church, another at a shopping mall in Portland, Oregon. Their safety from guns is now a basic concern for us. We are sickened that our country is flooded with guns. The shooters were all teenage boys. How can we keep guns out of their hands? You know, mass shootings. On the one hand, they account for less than 1% of deaths from firearm violence in the United States. On the other hand, they're the one form of violence about which nobody can come up with a story that leaves themselves out. And we're the people who make escape plans when we go to the mall these days. Um, and so we need to think about kids, but we also need to think more broadly about access. Uh, children who do violence most frequently get their guns from home. That strategy needs to focus not just on the children, but on their parents. Older kids get guns, can get guns from peers, from trafficking networks. Um, and we need to focus on law enforcement approaches to that. But we also, and there are programs now in place to do this, need to change the way kids think about guns. It is for kids, as it is for adults, a myth that they're safer if they have a gun. It's also a myth that all the other kids have guns. And when kids are exposed to the fact that not everybody else has a gun, so maybe they don't need one, and they're safer without one, their thinking and their behavior changes. This is not going to happen overnight, but it points a direction to the future. Thank you. Um, so uh, kind of along those lines, uh, Matthew, you know, when we reference somebody with somebody who submitted a question, Matthew or, or a comment, uh, Matthew notes that gun violence expert Dr. John R. Lott Jr. of the Crime Prevention Research Center states that when civilians are more likely to have guns to protect themselves, criminals are less likely to carry guns themselves. It kind of sounds to me like the whole good person with a gun, I'll stop a bad person with a gun kind of kind of philosophy. Uh, are you familiar with this research and, and what are your what's your take on it? So I, I am familiar with the research. I'm also familiar with John Lott. I've known him personally for years. He most recently wrote to me, I think, a month ago. Um, we're going to put something in the chat for the audience um, about about uh, John. His work as a body and that particular work in, uh, have, have been thoroughly debunked by other researchers in the field. And, and to be honest, I, I, I'm also an ER doc, I'm a clinician, and a, a discussion about John Lott's research on firearm violence prevention calls up for me the same sort of feelings I have about a discussion of the 
utility of ivermectin in treating COVID. It just doesn't happen. Um, and we need to remember about John that he's the guy who had much to say about a nationally representative survey that he conducted and then could provide no evidence whatsoever that he'd actually done the study, leaving people thinking he just fabricated it. He's the guy who invented a graduate student whose name was made up out of the names of his children to, focus, po to post fabricated compliments about him uh, at a time when his research was under question. There's real grounds to suspect both the man and his work. Yeah, no, th thank you for that. It's so important to be skeptical uh, of, of some of the things that we, we see, some of the things that people say. Uh, and and really do our own research to identify what's what's accurate and what isn't. Thank you for that, Dr. Winnemute. Uh, Gene wants to know how well are gun violence restraining orders working in our district? I know that Santa Clara uh, has filed, I think, um, among the most in the in the in the state. Um, how are gun violence restraining orders actually working? And uh, maybe we'll also turn to have she could comment on that in, in the in the the federal legislation that recently passed. And are we uh, around red flag laws and how that's going to help. Sure. Santa Clara and San Mateo both um, have been leaders. San Diego in Southern California. Um, we are big fans here. We've got probably half a dozen research studies underway about GVROs. Um, the upshot of them is this. Not all these data are ours, um, but for suicide, the best estimate is that a life is saved for every 10 to 20 of these orders that, that are issued. Let me put it in a clinical context as a doctor. Somebody gives me a new treatment and says, you'll save a life every 10 to 20 times you use it. I'm a big fan. Um, we are sitting on a series of 58 cases in California where GVROs were used in efforts to prevent mass shootings. And not one of those threatened mass shootings occurred. Zero for 58 is pretty good odds. And, and can we, I know we're wrapping up this yeah, session. Yeah, let's give me one last, I want to give you a chance for one last question. Well, I, I was just actually going to ask uh, Dr. Wanamu, can you, um, for folks who might not necessarily know what a GVRO is, sure. but can you maybe just explain to folks so, so that they know? Because I think they're a huge tool in the toolbox of addressing uh, gun violence. Sure. The idea is this. There's a crisis. Somebody is threatening harm to themselves or to others, and guns, access to guns are part of what make the crisis so urgent. Um, a gun violence restraining order is a civil court mechanism that allows a judge to hear evidence following specified rules and make a decision that, yep, we need to get the guns out of, out of the situation until we can cool it off and, and see what's going on. So a judge issues an order which prohibits the person making the threats from having those guns. The order is served by law enforcement and the guns are recovered for safekeeping. These orders are temporary because they have to be put in place in a hurry. New process is followed every step of the way. Thanks for that, Doctor. Well, we can wrap up. There's one question. I wanted to hear your take. Maybe we'll go to the next one as well. It says, how is the U.S. different from other countries that allow citizens to bear arms and yet do not have an epidemic of gun violence? And how do we get this way? I know that's hard to answer in a short period of time, but... It, it, it's, it's not. In the United States, there has to be a specific reason for you not to have a gun. In every other wealthy industrialized country, there has to be a specific reason for you to have a gun. And the upshot is we have more guns in this country than we have people. They are tools. They are being put to the use for which they were made. And that's where our mortality and injury rates come from. Thank you. That was an excellent answer. Very quickly and concisely. Every other country, you have to reason to have a gun. In, in our in our have to reason not to have one. In some states, you probably don't even, you know, in some states, you don't even have that. Right. Correct. Um, Correct. So, well, thank you very much. Uh, I think we're going to bring you back. Um, we take some more questions at the end, but thank you very much for your time. I'm now going to introduce the next panelist, Sheikha Hamilton. Sheikha is a, a resident of our district, and she's also vice president of organizing at Brady, where she works to develop strategies and oversee the implementation of grassroots advocacy and mobilization, including state and federal legislative efforts and public health and safety campaigns. She's been working on the issue of gun violence prevention since 2000, when she helped organize the Million Mom March, the largest protest against gun violence in U.S. history at the time. She's a licensed attorney. She's employed her skills as an organizer and attorney to, to support efforts to prevent gun violence and help others advocate for sensible gun laws, local, state, and national levels. She's most proud of work in California, 
where she lives, continues to work with local chapters, passed laws of instrumental, reducing California gun deaths by 51% along the lines we've just heard. She's received numerous uh, honors and awards, among them Pioneer for Peace, Congressional Recognition, and the ATF Award for Prevention of Gun Violence. Welcome, Sheikha Hamilton. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Assemblymember Berman and Senator Becker for even holding this important discussion today and especially your leadership on the issue. And I would really like to thank the audience for being here and wanting to talk about solutions. As you've all heard that California is the leader in gun violence prevention legislation, but that didn't happen by accident. As Dr. Wintemute mentioned, in the 1990s, as maybe some of you remember, firearm-related crimes across the country rose, and particularly in California. And that's when we began passing comprehensive gun safety laws. And the state's firearm mortality rate declined steeply by 59% by 2019. And there is more we can do, which we'll discuss later. So that's the good news. But the bad news, sadly, nationwide gun violence is now the leading cause of death for US children and teens. That is a statistic that we are all devastated by. We don't have to live like this. It's a solvable problem and our children cannot be continued to be sacrificed. And that is what should drive us to continue this work. At Brady, we believe we need to approach gun violence prevention in many ways, gun industry reform, safe storage, legislation policy, and a culture change by educating people about the dangers of a gun in the home. I really appreciate this opportunity to discuss this issue further with all of you uh, on where we've been, where we're going, and how, how all of us can play a role in the solutions to end gun violence. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll start out with the questions. And you have a national viewpoint. You're based here in California, obviously, but you have a national viewpoint. I'm just curious, how do you feel? Um, there's se several well-publicized events, um, particularly in Tennessee recently, um, which escalated at the legislative level. Um, there's been a number of accidental shootings that have been high profile recently. Um, and there was some progress at the federal level with legislation that actually was passed um, before the Republicans took control of the, of the House. How would you assess where we are at a, at a national level right now? That's a great question. So, you know, California is the model state. If the rest of the country would follow, we'd be in a much better place. Um, but thankfully to the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act, states, and in particular California, will be getting funding to focus on our gun violence restraining order and its implementation. But also we should be allocating some funding for education of the gun violence restraining order and safe storage firearm uh, education in schools, um, in the community, um, even, you know, when, when the GVRO was passed in 2014, which I was right there when, when that happened and the legislature reacted very quickly right after the Isla Vista shooting and enacted that law, it, it's taken years just for even law enforcement to use it. The education level for the GVRO is steep. And so we need to focus on that and so that people know it's available. Um, but it's a huge um, tool to save lives. And, and I can like list off a bunch of incidences, but I remember early on in Santa Clara, there was an incident where uh, a woman saw her husband load up his trunk with a bunch of firearms and he was headed to work. She didn't know what was going to happen, but she contacted law enforcement and they were able to stop him using that GVRO. So that is an important tool that we must educate people about. And then secondly, safe storage nationwide, even though California has good 
gun laws on safe storage. Um, but the issue is education again. Uh, two thirds of school shootings, the gun came from the home. Um, and we've seen that over and over again. And so locking up the gun, ammunition separately, keeps not only kids from getting a hold of a gun, but it also helps in situations where there's a crisis at home and, and somebody not having access to that gun can prevent a tragedy. I could go on, so I'm going to cut myself off right here in case you want to ask something further. Thanks, thanks, Chica. And uh, you know, we're, we're we're so lucky to have uh, numerous fantastic uh, anti-gun violence organizations, the Brady Campaign, uh, others, Every Town, Moms Demand. Can you tell us a little bit about how maybe the Brady Campaigns? The, the different different from and, and kind of complements some of the things that the other uh, organizations do. Absolutely. I mean, we work hand in hand with all the organization and because our goal is the same to save lives. And so how we go about it makes each of our organizations unique, in my opinion. We need an all hands on deck approach to solving the problem. Many local and national programs work tirelessly to intervene in and prevent violence through direct services, including hospital based services, violence interruption programs, increased access to education after school programs and job training. These efforts aim to decrease the demand for guns and drive related declines in urban homicide. But in addition to this important work, we must also address the supply of illegal guns that flood into our communities and drive urban homicide. And that's what we focus on. I'll tell you about a recent discovery at Brady. We found that there are 90 law enforcement agencies purchasing their supply of firearms from two prominent dealers that have significant ATF violations. And so, and that was through the work of our FOIA requests through the ATF. ATF is underfunded, that's a whole nother topic. Um, but so we're working in our communities, talking with uh, community leaders about changing the process because taxpayer dollars are going towards funding uh, these companies, these dealers that are not behaving properly. And so it's becoming a vicious cycle. And so that's just one of the ways that we're slightly different. Um, and then we have our litigation team that's been doing this work for 45 years. And so we continue that. And then we focus on combating crime guns through an approach that focuses on dealer tracing and where are those guns coming from and how we can curb the illegal flow. Excellent. That's great to hear about the that tracing and curbing the illegal flow. And you mentioned a couple, a couple of the very specific examples uh, around gun violence restraining orders and safe storage. Is there any other legislation either pending or ideas that, that you have for the two of us, you know, things that you think California could be doing uh, more of? Well, we can expand our uh, child safety access prevention law. Currently, it requires that you lock up a gun and so that a child does not have access, but you, you could uh, safe away from a child, but you could require that they actually lock the gun up. And, and that's what communities are actually doing. San Mateo County supervisors passed that ordinance and, and ha, are going to communities to get that done. There's right now, there's, um, I don't know if many of you heard about the Bruin decision that's going to weaken the concealed carry laws, but California is actually passing a law to strengthen that. And so supporting dealer trainings, um, you know, we just passed last year um, videotaping of gun sales. Though These are all important things that we can continue to do. But I think focusing on dealer reform is where it's at. Thank you, uh, Shiga. I really appreciate all those uh, good points. And uh, we, we have a couple of questions uh, that we might ask 
uh, when we get to the group stage uh, of the conversation, but okay. really appreciate everything that you're doing at Brady. Um, so our next panelists are Dr. Jennifer DiBrianza and Rudy Espinoza Murray. Rudy Espinoza is a dad and gun sense advocate that joined the gun violence prevention movement after the Pulse shooting in Orlando. He started as a bilingual state lead for the Be Smart campaign, teaching adults how to securely store guns in their homes and community, something Shika was just talking about, uh, and leading the social media team as state communications lead. He now serves as the California chapter of Moms Demand Action spokesperson, creating awareness of the uniquely American problem of gun violence and how people can join the movement. Dr. Jennifer DiBrianza is a math educator and a mom to three children. She began her activism in gun violence prevention after the massacre at Sandy Hook. Uh, and and uh, Jennifer currently serves as president of the Palo Alto Unified School Board, uh, where I've had a chance to work with her on a lot of issues. Uh, thank you so much. I uh, want to welcome Jennifer and Rudy. Thank you for having us. And I don't know if either of you would like to make any opening remarks or dive right into the questions. I can go ahead and get started. I just want to say I'm honored to be here with all of you uh, as spokesperson for Moms in Action California. I speak to folks all the time on this issue. And one of the top questions I get asked is like, what can I do? Uh, I used to ask myself that question uh, because I felt that nothing was happening. Uh, and it wasn't until I joined an organization like Moms in Action, a grassroots organization, uh, that I feel like I could do something. And I, and I learned a few things when I joined. And one was that uh, there isn't just like one thing that we can do to stop gun violence. It's, there's so many different things that need to happen for us to really reduce gun violence. And two, that there's a place for everyone in the gun violence prevention movement. Uh, we have, specifically with moms, we have dads, moms, grandparents, youth, wealthy, low-income folks, folks with PhDs. Uh, and it's people that simply want to make a difference. Uh, and it's orgs like Moms in Man Action, Students in Man Action, and the Brady Campaign that give people uh, the tool for, for change. Great. Uh, thank you so much for having us. Thank you, uh, Assemblyman and, and Senator, for hosting this so, such an important topic. Um, and what struck me most in, in agreeing to do this was I sort of am wearing two hats as a gun violence prevention advocate, usually with Moms Demand Action, and as a board president. Of course, my primary role as board president is to ensure the safety of our students. Um, but as was mentioned earlier by um, Dr. Whitney, is only about 1% of the, of the deaths due to gun violence are these mass shootings, mm -hmm. um, so a fraction of which are school shootings, right? So those are the ones that get a lot of press. And those are the ones that, of course, are really scary because they are so random. Um, but it, it is such a small fraction of the massive amounts of gun violence in the country every year. Um, so being aware of the things that can make the most impact, the most low hanging fruit, that more than half of all those gun deaths are suicides every year. So that speaks to safe storage and speaks to um, you know, training and, and whatnot. So I'm in Palo Alto and we're really lucky that we have a local ordinance that requires safe storage. Um, I think even stricter than the state does. So um, working on the school board and, and talking about how we can educate students and parents about the, the laws and about what makes a difference. So I'm excited to be here. Thank you so much uh, for being here. Josh, I don't know if you want to jump in. Well, I just want to say that um, from a personal standpoint, you know, it's funny, I just literally bumped into Rudy uh, at the halls of uh, uh, of our capital in Sacramento and bumped into one of my law school classmates also uh, um, volunteering for moms who I didn't know was active. And it just really um, helps all of us when we see folks, especially folks from the district who are up here uh, taking their time to advocate on behalf of some of this legislation. Um, and I think do you I had some things maybe you could even share with us um, that just kind of around, I, kind of, I think it's still around this question of what can people do. Um, you have some thoughts you share with us, maybe even uh, to share your screen possibly. Yeah, thank you, Senator. And if uh, Terry can help us sharing the slides, I, I put some slides together just to make it easy for folks that are listening. Uh, to, to take some action. Um, so one of them is if you're interested in joining uh, Moms Demand Action, and again, whether you're a dad, a mom, a cousin, a brother, uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, this organization is for everyone. You can text READY to 64433 uh, and just follow the prompts uh, via text yeah. message uh, to get involved. Uh, there are also a few other slides um, that I want to share. If we can skip to those. 
Um, so one is the, the, and Chico was talking about this in, on safe storage and there's a the Be Smart campaign. There's actually a training happening on April 26th. And if I, I think y'all are also getting the, the links uh, in the chat, but April 26th, uh, 6 p.m. in English and at 6.50 uh, in Spanish, you can take the QR code uh, right now with your cell phones if you're watching this, or you can go ahead and use the bit.ly link, which is bit.ly Be Smart presentation. And it's really to teach folks on how to securely uh, uh, store their, their guns, but also if they don't have guns and their kids are going to other homes, the parents are asking if there are guns in, in those homes where your kids are visiting and being comfortable with that and making sure that guns are stored safely. And this just makes for a safer community. And I'll go to the another slide. Um, and one of the priorities that Bombs Man Action has right now in California is, is AB 28 called the Gun Violence Prevention, Healing and Recovery Act. So there are many uh, pieces of legislation right now. Uh, you know, Assembly Member uh, Berman mentioned a few that he's working on. Uh, this is another one. And this specific legislation is, tax, is a tax on firearms and ammunition. And the revenue from that tax is going to be used to fund CalVIT, which is California uh, Violence Intervention and Prevention. Uh, this funds organizations all across the state that are using evidence-based methods on reducing gun violence, and they work. And this is to fund that. Uh, we've been lucky that we have a governor uh, that has supported this, and he has increased funding from 9 million a few years ago to over 200 million, but it needs to be sustainable. And this is one of those ways that we can ensure that we are funding the programs across the state. Uh, next slide, please. And you can take action right now. You can go ahead and call uh, the Assembly's Revenue and Tax Committee uh, or send messages. Uh, use this QR code to find out who those, who's on that committee. You can pick up the phone and call them. There's also a form that you can fill out online to send a message uh, to those folks. And you can use this QR code. And I hope that uh, staff would help by also copying these uh, links and putting them in the chat for folks. I know we have limited time, so I don't want to take up uh, more space. Rudy, I, I love that, and it, you know, it's it's the same concept we have with cigarettes, right? You know, gun violence, it's it's a it's a public health hazard, it's a public health issue, um, and so let's tax the you know the what's causing the the health hazards, and then use that for for prevention and, and for programs. Uh, it's also authored by my seatmate on the assembly floor and my roommate up here in Sacramento, Jesse Gabriel, uh, who's who's the chair of the Legislative Jewish Caucus that Senator Becker is the vice chair of. So we we all have a lot of appreciation for for AB 28. Uh, so uh, there are a couple questions uh, that we've received from folks. Uh, Maureen thinks that um, influencing, advocating petitions, calls, letters are not working and that we need Congress to make sweeping changes in gun control in the United States. Uh, do, do, do Does anyone have any thoughts on that? Anyone want to kind of dive into? Uh, I, I would love to. Um, I would argue they, they are making a difference. And, and I'm curious to know, you two as elected officials probably hear from people about these issues. Um, what we need to do is not just write to them and say, please vote this way, but we need to not vote for people that won't vote for the things that we expect to see. Um, but just looking back over the 10 and a half years since Mom's Demand started, um, that very first January, right after the December uh, Sandy Hook, we were in DC and, and Democrats brought forth um, some legislation about background checks and whatnot. And a lot of us really thought that those would pass no problem and they didn't. And we were really surprised. And it was the, 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 the NRA folks sort of laughed and, and were like, you thought, you know, we've seen groups come and go, but over the decade, the, the, the grassroots powerhouse influence that these groups have made in writing, in advocating, in door knocking before elections is, is making a huge difference. Um, and you can probably speak better than than we can about um, if you're in Sacramento and you see a whole sea of orange or a whole sea of red coming in, you know you better be on your A game because they are there to hold you accountable for how you're voting. Well, that, so that, I would argue it does make a difference. Yes, federal laws need to be passed because we can have the laws we want. But if you could just go to, Alabama, uh, to Arizona and get a gun and bring it right back here, you're right. Federal laws are important. 
Absolutely. And I, I agree. I've, I, and, and, you know, Josh referenced this earlier when he mentioned bumping into Rudy, uh, you know, it, it, it really, the capital and, and the swing space that Senator Becker and I are in right now, it's a small space. And so when you come here with dozens or hundreds of advocates and activists uh, to, to lobby on behalf of issues that you care about, we see that we feel that um, it, it really gets noticed and it has a big impact. And I want to say it's important to target everybody. Um, because last year we had 60 Democrats or 59 Democrats in the assembly. Um, and we had a, 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 uh, it was a two thirds bill. So we needed 54 assembly members, but we had way more than that of Democrats, um, to close the loopholes that were created by the Supreme court in regards to concealed carry. And it didn't get the votes, uh, because there were some Democrats that didn't support that. So, you know, we really need to make sure that all of us here, uh, Democrats and Republicans, um, you know, get, get special attention from y'all uh on on you know advocacy and 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 pressure frankly to do the right thing and do the right thing to keep our communities safer uh, to make our communities safer so i i i'll let senator becker uh yeah i I think the the gun violence that what passed at the national order the restraining order so it did have end up having some republican support correct yes yeah i guess you can add on that um so, you know, that had an impact as well, obviously, clearly. Um, well, I think we'll uh, bring maybe everyone back and just kind of do a bunch of group questions if um, if that works, if we're able to kind of fit folks in. But I want to say while we're doing that, I appreciate your optimism, the optimism of our previous two speakers as well, because when you hear optimism from folks who've been working on this issue for a long time, it makes me more optimistic. And um, and more hopeful, and especially with Dr. Quinton, we talk about this as a science, and saying you know what we can learn the lessons, and, um, and and we're doing that. And um, I guess the last point I'll make on the advocacy piece we were just talking about, I think as you can hopefully hear from uh, throughout this town hall, there's a lot of legislation, and and that's why it's important people weigh in because all those legislations are going through different committees, and. Um, and so there's different amendments being asked of them, and, we, and sometimes you need people to stand up, and sometimes those amendments make it better. Sometimes we need people to stand up and um, and sort of push back against that. Um, but just along some of the other lines that we talked about uh, with bills, uh, Sheikha mentioned uh, the SB2. That's the bill that's going to uh, strengthen the concealed carry regime in the wake of the Supreme Court decision. Uh, SB8 in the Senate is the Firearms Liability Insurance. San Jose has led the way around this uh, pioneering this uh, firearms liability insurance, and we're now uh, working on on increasing that. And Assemblymember Mike Fong, who represents the District of Monterey Park, where there was a mass shooting, has a bill 733 prohibiting any state or local government agency or department from selling firearms, uh, firearm parts, ammunition, or body armor. As you know, one of the most disgusting things that happened, say, in Kentucky with the recent shootings is they have to resell those weapons basically by law, which is, which is insane. And um, we're actually in this case prohibiting um, those agencies from reselling those, those weapons. Um, so a lot of things that are going on um, this year. And so a lot to weigh on. And it's not, you know, not just one omnibus bill sometimes happens at the federal level. We have a lot of pieces. So again, if we can welcome all the panelists, back and we'll take questions. Uh, Felix asks, um, what do, can we learn from countries uh, with no gun violence, such as Belgium? Um, maybe that's Dr. Ward to me. Maybe you have some thoughts there. Uh, I, I was actually writing about uh, precisely this just a couple of days ago. Um, one of the myths is that Americans are somehow uniquely violent as people. And that's simply not true. Um, if you compare us to other wealthy industrialized countries, um, our rates of robbery and assault are actually lower than the average for wealthy industrialized countries. And as I was doing the research a couple of days ago, I was struck by, wow, Belgium has higher rates of robbery than we do of all places. Um, the, the, the difference in the United States is not the rate of violence. It's the outcome of violence. Where we are unique is in our rate of fatal violence. And that happens because we have a unique level of access to a consumer product that changes the outcome. 
There are other factors involved, but absent our high, high rate of firearm ownership, we would not have the rates of fatal and non-fatal firearm violence that we have. So, so are you saying, uh, Dr. Winnie, that you disagree uh, with, with the argument that I have heard ad nauseum, uh, which is that we don't have a gun problem, we have a mental health problem? Um, we do have a mental ad, health problem. I was just going to say, ad, 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 nauseum, ad nauseum is a good way to put it. But, but to, use, to use mental health as a diversion um, away from the, the, the fact that we have a gun problem um, is it's basically dishonest. Um, we have a gun problem. We also have a mental health problem. We have a whole array of social problems. We have racism and poverty and exclusion, all of which are leading factors for violence, whether we're talking about assault or self-harm. If I feel excluded from society, if I feel like I have no future, if I feel like I have no alternative means of getting what I legitimately need, then I make recourse to violence, whether I'm a young person contemplating a robbery or an old man contemplating suicide. There are common denominators here. May I add a little something to that? Please. Um, because I hear this question all the time, too. And what I'd like to remind people is that in every part of this world, there are people with mental health issues. And in the industrialized countries, there's video games and all these other external issues. But the United States is different in that we have this uh, almost unfettered access. And so if we, you know, have sensible regulations, we truly can't save lives. Well, I appreciate that. And I have, you know, one of my good friends from went to school with, it, you know, lives in the district and there's also a responsible gun owner and he has he you know we have good conversations sometimes we'll say so he'll push back well that's not going to work that's not going to work and i'll push back on him um sometimes as well but um you know we can agree on things like safe storage right we can there uh, we can agree on things like gun violence restraining orders um i had a question again for jennifer rudy your experience and and um you know, and we were just up here recently. What most surprised, without naming names, what most surprised you about uh, advocating up in, in Sacramento, either positively or negatively? What most surprised you? I would say the positive side is is how everyone at least is on the same page of wanting to save lives. And that is an incredible feeling to know that at least we're we're on that same base. I think there might be differences in how people uh, view the way to do that, but generally speaking, uh, the majority, at least at least the folks that that I met with, even uh, and on both sides, because I've met with both Democrats and Republicans, that there is a desire to do something uh, versus just giving thoughts and prayers, and and that is uh, impressive and and very good uh, to to see. Yeah, I think I think I'm a I, I haven't. Um, been to Sacramento recently, but continue to go to DC. And I think what surprised me is almost the flip side of it is that even people who will acknowledge that this is an epidemic and that something needs to be done and that we can do something, the 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 decades old fear of taking that action and taking that stand and the price they think they're going to pay for it, even though time and again, we see that that the community in general, the entire country is in support of some of these common sense things. Um, but it's just, we have to really help them shift their thinking. So I think that's been the frustrating thing is the people that still just offer thoughts and prayers and say, there's nothing we can do. Or I know there are things we should be doing, but I just can't even risk it. And isn't and that's such a funny thing. First of all, I'm glad to hear that, that at least from Rudy and, and, and I hope and assume from Jennifer in DC, that y'all are meeting with Democrats and Republicans. I think that's so important. Um, and, and uh, you know, I, I think things are a little less partisan here in Sacramento, but I have very good relationships with with many Republican colleagues um, who who I consider to be thoughtful, um, you know, on these important issues. Um, but it's so fun. I, I see things, Jennifer, to your point um, in, in and I'm going off script here, uh, but, you know, actions that politicians are taking in other states that the data, the polling shows that their constituents don't want um, and don't support. 
Um, and, and Florida currently pops into my head. Um, I, I don't know if anybody wants to speak to that um, and, and have any suggestions for what we can do, um, you know, more to try to to try to give uh, the cover and the strength to the politicians who, who want to do a certain thing, but don't feel like they can politically. I mean, the numbers don't support them, right? In every state, a majority wants to see background checks and does not want just open carry. Um, so I think really voting and speaking up about it, even if you're in a, you know, if you're if you're in a state that is more conservative or that you, you don't necessarily agree with your representative on everything about, speak up about this issue to let them know that you've got their back. And we all have friends who live in these states. I mean, I've got two of my best friends that I grew up with in Palo Alto now live in Florida. Um, and so, you know, I need to reach out to them and, and see what they're doing to support organizations out there um, to, to, to enact good, positive change. Um, so uh, we had a, a question. Somebody asked what's what Alexander asked, what, you know, what statistics have led us to having a 10 round magazine limit instead of a six round or a 15 round or a 17 round? Um, you know, any any ideas to why that's the case? I can start and other people can, can fill in. Um, <clears throat> guns and magazines and the things that other things that go with them um, are consumer products. And that approach was product driven. Um, magazines come and they come smaller, but 10 round magazines are really common in 20s and 30s. And they're, they're, it, the, the number didn't originate with the policymakers. It originated with the answer to the question, what products are out there? And at what threshold do we see an increased risk of, of harm? And folks settled on 10. I mean, remember, these, these policies were adopted before ARs and AKs were widespread. It's one of the reasons it's hard to show the effectiveness of the assault weapons ban way back. Um, but the fundamental point is to remember, this is an ordinary effort to regulate a consumer product. It just happens to be the product that it is, and that's the rest of the story. Thank you for that. If anyone wants to comment, but yeah, it, it, uh, opponents to restrictions who um, on who can buy a gun consi consistently cite the Second Amendment. And as you know, the Second Amendment was enacted, the weapon of choice, a musket, could fire three to four rounds a minute where today's assault weapon fire hundreds of rounds a minute. Um, I had a, a question along those uh, lines. Um, and Meredith says, what is the biggest obstacle in local and statewide policymaking um, regarding gun safety? And um, I guess mentioned maybe at the local level, Jennifer Moody, if you're working at the local level, I think she could, you mentioned San Mateo's uh, safe storage legislation. Jennifer, you mentioned Palo Alto, um, putting something in place. Uh, any thoughts on biggest obstacles, uh, local and statewide? Yeah, if I can start, I, I think at a, at a local level, a, a lot of it is who's in office, right? So one of the things that uh, Moms Main Action does is advocates uh, for uh, what they call gun sense candidates, right? Making sure that folks that are getting into office do support gun safety policies, common sense gun safety policies. Uh, so, so that's one of them. Uh, even here in you know San Mateo County, uh, we've had folks uh, back off from safe storage ordinance, for example, uh, because of threats coming from residents, right, to sue, um, which could be something very costly and expensive. Uh, for for you know local jurisdiction, um, so we see some of that resistance uh, happening, uh, but the majority of folks uh, are for the common sense. Uh, otherwise, it would be common sense, right? Like common sense safety, uh, safe storage, like a safe storage ordinance um, that they can show up and advocate for. I think the biggest thing we can do when we were talking about this earlier is that showing up, right? That we support our city council members, our county supervisors. Uh, our school boards uh, to make to enacting this policy, and that it, it is what saves lives, uh, and taking it above and beyond what even the state of California has provided uh, as an example for the safe storage ordinance, where locally we've gotten the majority of 
the cities in San Mateo County uh, to pass a safe storage ordinance, which says that anyone that has a gun needs to store it safely in a safe uh, separate from their ammo. Because the state law just says uh, if you have a minor in the house, but however, you can have a minor coming to your house if you yourself don't have children living in the house. Uh, they can find a weapon uh, they can, and, and use it or accidentally shoot themselves. Or if someone breaks into your home, many of the guns that are used in crimes are stolen guns. So at the end of the day, what we're doing is trying to protect our communities and our families, uh, but we still, we still have obstacles, even in areas that we think are progressive uh, or for, or for uh, passing safe, uh, um, gun safety measures. Uh, there's still obstacles uh, that stand in the way. There are still groups that uh, are trying to put uh, money behind uh, stopping any further uh, gun safety laws from, from being passed. And I would just add on to Rudy's comments that um, outside of legislation and policy, we have education campaigns on safe storage. Like, you know, uh, endfamilyfire.org talks about the dangers of a gun in the home, but also it, we don't come at gun owners as bad people because we realize gun owners, they bring a gun in the home to protect their family, but they should also know the dangers of it, how to keep their weapon safely stored um, away from children and people in a crisis. So talking about safe storage is really critical in all communities and it will save lives. And asking if there's a gun in the home where your child plays when you ask them about swimming pools and peanut butter or dogs is, is another way. So don't give up if legislation and policy doesn't work. There are other ways to talk about this issue. I think that's such an important point, and it also kind of, uh, uh, kind of, um, isn't necessarily trying. It's not trying to take guns away from people. It's trying to make sure that when folks own guns, that they do it safely, um, and just make sure that people have information about best practices, about certain dangers, uh, so that we hope that people who do own guns avoid the unintended and 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 possibly deadly consequences of that gun ownership. So it's, it's, you know, when folks say, oh, you just want to take everyone's guns away, that's not accurate. Um, but we want to make sure that if, if folks make the decision to own a gun, uh, that they have the right to do, assuming they haven't done certain things that, that uh, restrict that right, then that they just do it in as safe a way as possible. Um, so, so somebody, asked, Gregory asked a question that, um, that I've heard in a conversation before also. He wants to know if California can utilize its state line agricultural inspection stations to check for and turn back from entering uh, into California firearms and firearm paraphernalia that don't conform to California's laws for gun safety and gun sense. And so what I've heard is that, you know, uh, we, we share a border with other states and, and you can go into, there'll be, um, you know, massive gun uh, 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 kind of conventions in Nevada uh, or in Arizona. And when you go over there, all the cars in the parking lots have California license plates uh, and, and they're buying guns in, in these other states that you can't legally buy in California. Uh, does anybody want to talk at all about uh, ideas around, um, you know, kind of regulating uh, and trying to restrict uh, those illicit guns from coming into California from our neighboring states. Oh, I, okay, I'll let you. <laughs> um, I would just say that's why a federal expanded Brady background check law is needed. Um, when the Brady law was passed, it didn't anticipate these websites and gun shows, and so that's why it's important is to if we had a federal law um, requiring background checks on all gun sales. Um, to piggyback, I, I think um, using the ag stations, probably not sustainable. Um, there would need to be searches and stuff. It would be hugely expensive. But let me tell you about something that does happen, and I'll be very brief. Um, it is the case. I know this because I did the work myself. Um, if you go to gun shows in Nevada near the border, a third of the cars in the parking lot have California plates. I've walked a lot and counted them. Um, but other people know that, too. And without going into too much detail. If you are at a gun show in Nevada, and, and I assume Arizona, 
and you buy a lot of stuff that's illegal in California, and you throw that stuff in the back of a car that's got California plates, people are watching, and there's a fair chance that when you cross the border, you're going to get pulled over. Um, there's a there's an interstate law enforcement operation that's been going on off and on for decades designed to catch that interstate trafficking that, that in Northern California frequently targets the Bay Area. Thank you, Dr. Yeah, um, super interesting. Um, I, I had a question I mean, that kind of touches on this notion of, right, the guns getting to, um, uh, you know, used by someone who didn't purchase them, right? And I've wondered for a while about biometric controls of guns and looked at doing legislation on that. I was just told it was too far off and too hard. But I heard recently, just from someone up here, that, that there's a manufacturer who has that now and ready to go. Uh, what, what do you hear about biometric? Uh, so, for example, your fingerprint will be imprinted and only that person could then pull the trigger. Is that a reality and something we could possibly do laws around in the near future? I'll start since nobody else is going. Um, so the idea has been around for a long time and products have been brought to market from time to time for about 20 years now. They've never caught on, um, even when they've been brought to market by major manufacturers, in part because the rest of the industry has either boycotted the retailers that were willing to sell them or boycotted or threatened to boycott the manufacturer that was, was bringing them. Um, there is some history to this. We could talk about it further. Um, at one time, New Jersey had a law that said the moment that such a gun was introduced to the market, from that moment, within three years, all guns sold in New Jersey had to be smart guns, to use the term, because there are a lot of different technologies. Um, it just has never caught fire in the past. Doesn't mean it wouldn't in the future. Yeah, that was called the ch child proof handgun bill in New Jersey passed around 2002. And there is an industry boycott that happens every time. In California, one time, a gun dealer actually put one on the shelf and then that dealer was boycotted. And so then they took it down. And so it is an important step for safety. So I'd love to see this happen. The technology is here, you, you believe. There are a lot. <laughs> Go ahead, doctor. Well, there are a lot of possibilities. People have, and, and I have not tracked this issue in the last probably five years, but fingerprints have been discussed. Um, rapid sequence um, pressure on a, on a combination of um, RFID technology, the stuff we have in our name tags, you wear the, the secret decoder ring, basically. And if you've got the ring, um, you can fire the gun. Um, so th th I think the thing to do would be to find out what the stage of development of all those different approaches is, uh, find out whether there are products that really could be brought to market um, at a price that makes them affordable. Um, and there is a counter argument, since we're talking about this, um, that, and again, the product never came to market, so nobody knows, but the, the, the concern was suicide might go up. People who wouldn't buy a gun because because it might create a hazard for the household, would buy a gun because they were the only people who could fire that fire it, and then sometime later they might use it on themselves. So uh, we got a question in, uh, around how likely is it that SB two uh, that that a lot of folks have alluded to will hold up in court, given the response to uh, bill results in New York. Uh, and I'm not as familiar, um, but but maybe the New York legislation might have been overturned. I know that we're being very strategic and tact, uh, tactical, uh, you know, in, in our legislative responses. But I don't know if anybody uh, can speak to some of those specifics. I can speak to the specifics on what might happen as far as a lawsuit. But California is definitely primed for this legislation and it's it's reasonable. There's there's uh, nothing in it that would um, hurt uh, responsible gun owners from carrying a gun. It's just more safety. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Looking at other questions, Carly and Leah ask if we could pass any laws to make it easier for coworkers, friends, family to report gun violence to take away guns from the dangerous, unstable. 
can we educate people on signs of distress and the ways to remove guns from dangerous people? So that's exactly what we've been talking about. So obviously they, they're not quite aware yet of this notion of gun violence restraining orders and red flag laws. So just hopefully this, even just having this forum today is educating them and, and others uh, as, as well. Um, Diana asks, how are we addressing regulating the prevalence of ghost guns? We did have some legislation on that last year, uh, but Diana asks, how can we stop their distribution? And maybe you can explain um, before you answer, Dr. Winterby, what ghost guns are. Sure. Um, a ghost gun is manufactured privately. Nobody knows about it. It has no serial number. If it's used in a crime, it's not traceable. Um, I, I have been down this rabbit hole. Um, and the, the mantra is the only gun you really own is the one that nobody knows about. So if I'm a criminal, particularly a criminal enterprise, um, if I am a militia organization and I'm seeking to arm up without uh, giving any hint that I'm doing that, I wanna make the guns myself. It's easy to do. Um, to skip to the chase, here in California, where the licit market is regulated, major law enforcement agencies have sometimes reported that 30 to 50% of all the guns they recover in crime are these unserialized, privately manufactured ghost guns. Um, we have really strong legislation now here in California that's being implemented stepwise. There have been some lawsuits. There's been regulatory action by BATF and there's now reg new federal regulation in place. Um, there's grounds for optimism, but there's a race between the regulators on one hand um, and the industry on the other, um, which seeks simply to maximize sale of its products without regard for what those products do. Not clear who's going to win, um, but I think the momentum has shifted in favor of the good guys. So um, one question that was asked was, how can gun manufacturers be held liable for the societal damage they've caused? How can we repeal the laws that give them immunity to lawsuits? Uh, which I know is a, a federal issue and, and not a state issue, but I don't know if anyone has any thoughts on that. Um, I would just say that our legal department has been uh, working diligently in representing victims and survivors and have found some ways um, to to work around that immunity bill, uh, immunity law. Um, for example, the CND Hook families had a lawsuit uh, against the gun industry for the way they marketed uh, those weapons um, to, uh, to particularly that shooter um, and the messaging he received. And uh, we helped with that theory that the way the industry markets is gross negligence at times. And so, and the Sandy Hook families did win that lawsuit. So the, our team continuously works around that, but the best thing would be if everybody got on the phone and, and pushed for that, a repeal of that law, because it is the only <laughs> law that, you know, is preventing um, victims and survivors from getting their day in court in places, in many places. Mm -hmm. I do want to add to, to Sheikha's comments. I, I think we also need to talk about the cost of gun violence in America. Uh, the estimate's over $500 billion a year. And it, it's important because taxpayers are paying a huge portion of that. And I think it needs to be part of the conversation uh, when discussing this issue is that there is a cost and there's a cost that Americans that pay taxes are paying for by not mm -hmm. being able to hold these uh, gun manufacturers liable. Yeah, great point. Um, Jennifer, we have a lot of... Uh, Riza, Shu, Amshra, Bridget, Lauren, Janet, Deborah, Juana, uh, Meredith ask about what are we doing to prevent gun violence in schools? What should we each be doing and advocating for to make sure our children are safe? Any thoughts from you? I think there's a wide range of things that, that are happening. The, the most impactful thing is safe storage laws and education, um, right? Because that will, and mental health supports, right? All of those things together. Um, what I can say we're doing is um, when it comes to physicality, uh, that's a tough one in California because they're very open campuses, right? And and I think that um, 
uniformly, <laughs> the large majority of people do not want to turn our schools into prisons, right? We don't want to build tall gates and walls around schools and have armed guards. And we have seen cases where there have been school shootings that had those things, right? That, that had an armed guard and they were shot or they ran away or they were ineffective. Um, or there was a, it was a very secure site and the person got in anyway because of an unlocked door or whatnot. Um, so we're, we're talking about ways to what are the most high tech cameras we can have that we can spot something suspicious right away. Um, what education can we give to students to make sure they understand the consequences of, of bringing a gun to school or um, the impact of even having a gun in the home? And we're just writing into our priorities for the coming year, um, working with um, the the city and the police department about um, the safe storage laws, working with our um, our parent PTAs and educating parents and what kind of instruction we can do within the school day to make sure students really understand um, the data, the real facts around this issue. And again, I'd like to add um, real quickly, last year we passed a law that will require school districts to send home a letter uh, notifying families of California safe storage laws. And if we want to talk about advocacy, that was a 12 year effort on the part of our grassroots who used to go to school district by school district, asking them to send this letter home. And then we went to the state superintendent who did it. And then we went after a bill. So, I mean, that's the evolution of grassroots and what you can do to make a difference. But this, again, knowledge is power. Educating people will save lives. I had no idea that was a 12-year effort. That's it started in 2011. Yeah, good example. I was a volunteer then. I used yeah. to go school district to school district, so I know. I'm so, <laughs> so grateful to everyone for, for working on that for so long. Yeah. Um, so a, a quick kind of practical question. Um, and, and it kind of alludes to something that Sheikha mentioned with, with an anecdote um, around a husband that was going to work with a trunk full of guns. You know, if you see somebody in crisis, you see a crisis developing and you think that uh, a gun violence restraining order might be needed, what should you do? Like what, you know, what, what actions should you take? Um, this is this is really important. Um, we've talked a lot today about things that other people can do, that Congress can do, that legislators can do. Gun violence restraining orders come to each of us. This is the thing that we individually can do to help prevent gun violence. Most mass shooters declare their intentions in advance. People around them know what they're going to do. Most people who, are, who commit suicide declare their intentions in some way in advance. People know that something's going on. So the mantra, which has been around since our grandparents' time, is if you see something, say something. Um, it's, it really is just that simple. If, if you are a family member, a household member of the person who's, who's in crisis, you can be the petitioner yourself. Um, Certain school employees and coworkers can also be petitioners themselves. But people who work this tend to say, you know, let law enforcement um, be the be the petitioners. So you can either go yourself to a judge, and there's a website, speakforsafety.org, um, that has all the information, or you can contact local law enforcement, where typically the city attorney, it's how it works in the Bay Area at any rate, the city attorney will look at the case, and if they think it's indicated, will go to a judge. All of this happens in the course of a single day. Sometimes happens in the middle of the night if there's a law enforcement officer on the scene. But if there's if there are two things to do, one is make the commitment to say something, and the other one is pick up the phone and, and call the cops if you see a crisis. You don't want to be that person who knew it might happen, didn't do anything, and then it did happen. And so to oversimplify it, you, you can just call 911. You can just call, you can call 911 and, and tell them, hey, uh, you know, I'm seeing this happening and, and I'm worried that that something really bad is about to happen. Yes. Yes. That's fantastic. That's And and that, I mean, Senator Becker and I know we had a bit of a, a safety scare here in Sacramento uh, last Thursday um, that that part of it was because somebody had overheard uh, a, a gentleman say, I'm going to go shoot up the Capitol. Um, and, and they called the, the police and, and 
things snowballed from there. Um, so it's, it's, uh, you know, so important. Really appreciate that. Um, Josh, I don't know if you had any. Yeah, maybe do you want maybe one more and then we'll give uh, everyone a chance to, to do final closing uh, comments. Um, I guess my, my question for, for any of you really, um, it certainly seems in the interests of police, so many tragic, one, one thing in our roles, um, we do a journey of memories and colleagues do a journey of memories. And so um, if a police officer is killed somewhere in the state, we we hear about with a very emotional ceremony. Um, most of those are from guns. And then of course, you know, you just have accidental shootings where someone thinks it's a gun and it leads to this, this horrible incident. So you think that um, do you find uh, police now or are, are police organizations are partners now in gun control laws? And, um, and if not, what can do to be done more to get them to be partners in gun control laws? I think it depends. Uh, we we have there have been situations where we've partnered with local police departments because if more people have guns and there are people who shouldn't have guns that have them, it makes it more difficult for police officers to do their jobs. My brother's a police officer. So this is something that I, I talk to him about often when discussing uh, gun violence, uh, gun violence and, and, and gun safety uh, legislation. Uh, and even uh, what we just saw in Florida with uh, Governor DeSantis signing you know, a bill that says everyone can open carry without training, um, without a real age limit. Uh, as my, my brother was president of his police union, uh, actually uh, they advocated against that, right? They actually asked Governor DeSantis not to sign that. That would make uh, their jobs a lot more difficult. And the stats show um, that where they have open carry in states like Tennessee and Texas, they have you know highest uh, gun homicide rates. So it, it, it's, it's statistical. Um, so there are a lot of times where police for law enforcement do work uh, uh, with us, you know, the, the gun safety organizations uh, to get legislation passed. I know many times there are partners uh, with us. But on the other hand, um, there are some times where police officers use their guns um, uh, to kill folks. Uh, and that's also considered gun violence, right, when they uh, do that unnecessarily. Um, so we have two sides to, to, to that issue. And, and it's really important to recognize both that sometimes, yes, we partner with police and they're our allies, but other times they also commit acts of gun violence. Thank you. Thank you, Rudy. Um, so so somebody, uh, ironically named Mark, asked uh, if legislators who oppose gun safety controls have ever viewed the gory consequences of a gun violence. Uh, if they were mandated to view the victims' bodies and meet their, with their grieving parents or murdered school children, would they be more likely to alter their pro-assault weapons stances? And we've seen a little bit about this and folks comparing it to Emmett Till uh, and the open open casket that Emmett Till had uh, after his lynching uh, that his mom, uh, if I recall correctly, uh, kind of requested and demanded. Because um, so just want to throw that out there. Uh, and, and any thoughts on things that we could do to get folks to really appreciate just the horrific uh, damage that is done, especially by assault weapons. We talk a lot, we talk increasingly about accountability uh, on the part of people who have committed acts of violence, not incarceration, but facing concretely the people you've harmed if they survive, facing all of the damage that you've done. Um, and it might be interesting, I am way off uh, script here, but it might be interesting if legislators whose votes facilitated violence through the policies that those votes put in place um, encountered that same accountability process. I, I would like to add that the stories of survivors really have a huge impact on the gun violence prevention movement. And, and it's important that folks recognize uh, the role that they play. It's also important for folks to recognize if they themselves are survivors. Uh, many times people don't consider themselves survivors uh, and, and they are. Uh, I'm, I'm one of those people that for a long time I didn't consider myself a survivor, but uh, there are two instances in my life that, that are gun violence related. Uh, and you know, to answer this question, 
uh, it is important for these legislators to know and understand the impact of their votes or their obstruction of, of gun safety legislation. Uh, and, and we do do that. We do that by sharing our stories. Well, thank you for that, Anne. So, so it, uh, maybe let's give the person a chance to wrap up and then I'll let um, Simon Berman, you know, take us uh, home the final. Uh, and I do want to say thank you for sharing already some practical tips. I checked out your QR codes and they actually worked, which uh, <laughs> um, and um, give some good follow up uh, for everyone who's attending here and we'll watch uh, subsequently. Um, give each person, uh, you know, one, two minutes to wrap up and then uh, turn over to Simon Berman. And, and maybe a prompt to wrap up would be, you know, what's one thing that you want each attendee to take action on today? So, it's, you know, uh, for folks, for the 170 people we still have left, we're up to over 200, which, Josh, is, I, mean, I don't know about most of your town halls, but that's phenomenal uh, turnout. Uh, what's one thing that everybody can do uh, to, to improve the situation? Uh, I'll kick it off. I, I'm going to ask everyone to text ready to 64433 again the word ready to 64433 and get connected uh, with moms demand action and if anyone ever tells you that this work leads to nothing that advocating for gun violence prevention leads to nothing they are lying to you we can be effective california is the perfect example of how effective we can be and that we can save lives uh, and i also want to let folks know that this work is not easy work Getting involved in gun violence prevention is pretty tough and is very challenging. It deals with life and death of everyone, of children, of, of folks uh, with mental health issues. Um, you know, the hearing the stories of survivors is very, very emotionally tolling at times, but it is very fulfilling work and we need it to be done. One life saved, it makes it all worth it. So again, if you wanna get involved, doesn't matter if you're mom, dad, as I mentioned earlier, uh, a student, younger person, older person, if you want to get involved, uh, text READY to 64433. I also would invite you uh, to join organizations like Brady uh, that, you know, Shika was talking about. We all work hand in hand and we all have the same goal and the same mission, right, which is to save lives. I think the, um, the number one, in my mind, the number one thing you can do, because you all spent 90 minutes with us here, um, and people are busy and not everything's on their radar. And I would say, talk to people, talk to your friends, talk to your family about voting on this issue, about calling their representatives on this issue. Um, if, if all of the people that believe that we should have some common sense legislation took action for that, it would not be as, as hard as it is. Um, so, so keep, Keep advocating, keep speaking, keep writing, keep calling, even though sometimes it feels like it doesn't do anything. Um, your local representatives as well as your federal representatives and um, and talk to other people, encourage them to do it too. And thank you for hosting this. Uh, I'll just piggyback on Jennifer and Rudy. Thank you both for what you said. Um, this issue is complex, but it's solvable. And there's many ways to come at it, but really we need all hands on deck. We are in a public uh, ec epidemic crisis right now. Um, so it's more serious than ever. Our kids' lives are at stake in particular. Um, and it's a sad statistic, but we can solve this problem. So please join you know, Brady, Moms Demand Action, it doesn't matter whether you have five minutes, 10 minutes or hours to burn. Um, we, need you, we need you in this fight. And in California, we're getting it done. We just need the rest of the nation to follow. So I'll just throw in, please join, consider joining Brady by texting Brady to 866-89. Thank you. And thank you to Assemblymember Berman and uh, Senator Becker for the time here today. This is really amazing. Thank you. And I'll just add to those watching um, to make a public commitment that if you see something, you'll say something. Make it to yourself, but tell your friends so that they can help hold you accountable and maybe uh, follow your example. Um, and in the meantime, our group of people here will be 
working to gather the evidence on how best to prevent violence, knowing that we have colleagues like Senator Becker and Assemblyman Berman ready to put that evidence into action. Thank you. you all. Thank you. And, and before I turn it over and say, and with the addition of people watching, we have hundreds more sign up and they'll also get a video of this. So thanks to all of you. Over to you, Assemblyman Berman. No, thank you. Thank you, Senator Becker. Thank you, Josh. Uh, and thank you so much to our expert panelists uh, for this really awesome, informative, logical, uh, broad conversation today on, on you know, the current state of affairs and what more we can all do uh, from an individual basis to a national level to try to reduce gun violence in our communities, which I know is something we all want to do. Uh, so thank you to, to uh, Garen Winnemute, Sheikha Hamilton, Rudy Espinoza Murray and and uh, Jennifer DiBrienza, you know, you, you all have been fantastic and uh, look forward to many more conversations. Also, uh, thanks to uh, uh, Senator Becker's team and and in particular, Carrie Templeton, um, and and thanks to my team and and uh, Leslie Bullbook uh, for the roles that you played in, in helping get this uh, really important town hall up and running. And thanks to the over 200 plus constituents who joined us today. You can find a video of today's town hall and the resources discussed uh, on our websites, uh, uh, in particular on Senator Becker's website, sd13.senate.ca.gov. Um, probably on my website as well. I have no idea what the URL is, uh, but just Google me. It's not hard to find. Uh, so thank you, everybody, so much. Look forward to seeing you all next time.